Greetings, I'm your host, Scotty McGeester, and this is the first episode of Angry Scientist. What's Angry Scientist about? Well, it's basically me talking about stuff in the lab. Science stuff. This first episode is going to go over basic things in a lab. Now, by basic things in a lab, this mostly applies to biology, biochemistry, microbiology, molecular biology. This isn't really a physics lab. I've never really been to a physics lab, so this stuff doesn't really pertain to that. So this is more of a biology, chemistry side of things. It's going to be a lot of cursing, so if you don't like that, fuck you. But anyway, let's start out with rules. Rules to follow in the lab. Rule number one, always wear a lab coat and gloves. And fucking shit, I hate it when this shit happens. Hold on, I'm sorry, just fucking. Just, just hold on a minute. Ah yeah, time for your prostate exam. Yeah, always wear your gloves and your lab coat. Now, here's where I'm gonna be an ass. Here's an asshole warning. Here's an asshole. I don't always follow this rule because when you get used to wherever you're working in the lab you kind of get lazy and you skim the rules you're like I'm not gonna wear my lab coat because I know that I'm not working with any hazardous or messy chemicals or anything like that and that's fine if you're really confident that you're not gonna mess anything up but for the sake of argument for this video the number one rule is always wear your lab coat and your gloves because I know all you motherfuckers, you trip over nothing and you're gonna be like, oops, I dipped my hand in fucking cancer. Now I'm gonna like get a tumor and you know, it's your fault. Now, I don't have goggles because I never needed to use goggles in here. But also, remember to use safety goggles when appropriate, when there's fumes. When Rule number two, please label the fuck out of everything. You can't believe how many times grown ass men in this lab do not label their shit and it pisses me off now when i say label everything i mean be as specific as possible don't just say oh alcohol what's the concentration what date did you put it in uh, my boss likes to do this thing where we label all our batches by notebook numbers so for example 269.85 that means that if you go to notebook 269 on page 85 it'll show how this was all made and everything like that so because you know if you're trying to find like some solution of whatever and it's like okay how old is this is this expired is this the right amount is this you don't know anything it only takes like five seconds be as specific as possible because you you don't know if like someone's gonna throw it out too like someone can be like oh what the fuck is this uh, this isn't important but it is important and then now they threw it out because you're a fucking idiot and you didn't fucking label it so Fuck you. Rule number three, always know where your emergency first aid kit is. Put it somewhere where everyone can easily find it. It's not obstructed by anything so that if you're an idiot and you burn your hand, you know exactly where to run. A lot of labs also have um, showers, like eye washes, stuff like that. I don't have that here. Rule number four, always dispose of everything properly. For the most part, there are a lot of chemicals and mixtures that can just go down the drain. But if you're not sure of something, always double check, always ask. Because there's a lot of stuff that you can't put down the drain. Really dangerous shit that'll just fucking destroy the environment. And even if you don't believe in climate change, fuck you, you're gonna fucking destroy everything. Broken glassware, disposable glassware, all go inside a special trash, usually labeled broken glassware disposal. One of these things. Never put broken glass in a regular trash bin because someone's gonna pick it up, it's gonna jut out, fucking jam their leg, and they're gonna be like, ah, fucking shit, and they're gonna be bleeding everywhere, and it's gonna be your fucking fault. Now, there's another kind of special trash. It's one of these. Usually you call it an autoclave trash. Now, autoclave trash is whenever you, if you're doing stuff with bacteria, E. coli, you're contaminating a lot of disposable pipettes and petri dishes with bacteria. That 
you don't throw away in the trash. You throw away in an autoclave trash. It's usually in one of these disposable baggies that say biohazard on it. An autoclave is basically a giant oven. And you put that autoclave trash into the oven, sterilize it so that all the bacteria is dead, and then you can dispose of that material. Needles, needles also have their own trash. Again, I, this lab doesn't use any kind of needles, any kind of syringes of any sort, so we don't have a disposable for that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but look out for that too. Rule number five, never put food or drink in the microwave. That's just gross. <laughs> I can't use this now. I, I just wasted this for one joke. <laughs> it's the funny thing. I, uh, uh, fuck. But in all seriousness, don't use the microwave in the lab to eat or drink anything. You have no idea what other people have been putting in here. You could get fucking cancer for all you know. That's the bottom line of all these rules. Think of it as this way. You don't want to get cancer. That's why you follow these rules. Even the rules that have nothing to do with cancer. Just think of it that way. You don't want to get cancer. Just don't eat anything in the lab, okay? That includes pussy. Don't drink anything. Don't chew anything. Don't suck on anything. No sucking on dick. Just don't do that. All right, here's one of the most important tools you will use in a lab. This. Now, not everyone calls this the same name, and it's really fucking infuriating. A lot of people call this a pipetter, pipette man, Gilson, pipettes. It's a micro pipetter. Get it through your fucking head. It's a fucking micro pipetter. Why is it called a micro pipetter? Because it draws up liquid in microliters. That makes sense, you fucking imbeciles. So I went online for a quick second, just to make sure. And they actually call these pipe micro and they call these micro pipettes, which doesn't make fucking sense. Okay, I like to say when something's a pipette, it's the thing that holds the liquid. You know, this would this would be a micro pipette because it fits a micro pipetter and the pipetter is the thing doing the the pipetting because that makes fucking sense right but fuck for purposes of angry scientists i will always be referring to this as a micro pipetter okay it's my video my fucking rules suck it for every thousand microliters that's microliters that's a u L. It's not really a U. It has like a U with a thing on the bottom. It's, it's a Greek letter, I think. I don't fucking remember the name of it. But for every 1,000 microliters, there is one milliliter. So remember that. That is really important because you'll have to remember how to mentally move that decimal point in your head on the spot. So I'll give you some examples on how to read these because not all of these are the same thing. For example, this says P20. What the fuck does that mean, Scotty McGeester? This means that it could only draw up to liquid of 20 microliters. And so whatever you fucking do, don't be that asshole who tries to move it to like 21 microliters, cause you're gonna fucking break it. So for some micro pipetters, you'll notice a red number on the bottom. So since this is a P20, this reads right now 18.8 microliters. So that red number stands for the point whatever. Same thing on this one. This is a P2. This can only draw up to two microliters. So right now this is one microliter but 1.00. Get it? Now on some micro pipetters you might see the red number on the top. This is for really higher amounts. This is 1000 microliters which is Say it together, one milliliter. Yay, you're learning, fucking asshole. So, 
this. I was, forgot what I was gonna say. Since this usually only fits three numbers, you're gonna have to memorize the fact that on a P1000, this is gonna read, for example, 510. Like the extra zero is not really there. This red number is to remind you that it's below 1000. So you're actually reading, you're not reading 51 microliters, you're reading 510 microliters on a P1000. Same exact thing for P5000. This draws up 5000 microliters, which is five milliliters. So right now this reads 4000 microliters. Treat these carefully. Treat these like your life depends on it. These are your lightsabers. This is your gun. This is your trusty revolver. Don't go like, don't go pressing it like a hundred times because you're going to break it. These things are the ejectors. So you put the pipette tip. Here's some, some pipettes. Do it like that. Draw up liquid. And then you eject like that. Micro pipetters should always be calibrated at least once a year because if they're not calibrated, after a while, they're gonna draw up the wrong amount of liquid and that's gonna make a big difference. How are micro pipetters calibrated? You just call someone, a service, calibration service, and some guy comes in and does some stuff with it and you, know, you don't really have to do anything unless you have that job, in which case, kudos to you because that's really fucking tedious. I've seen someone go through all these fucking micro pipetters and it's a bitch. I feel sorry for you. But lucky for me, I didn't apply for that job. So I don't have to worry about that. What I like to do just once in a while when you're really fucking bored and have nothing else to do, I like to practice my pipetting skills by drawing up distilled water and putting it in a beaker. And you put the beaker in an analytical balance and you just draw up liquid and put it in there and see if it comes out the right amount. The nice thing about distilled water is that one milligram is equivalent to one microliter. So if you draw up one microliter of distilled water and weigh it out, it's gonna come out one milligram of distilled water. So based on that, you can do a nice little training exercise to make sure that you know how to pipette the right amount. This is a serological pipette. This draws up liquid in milliliters, and they all come in varying sizes. So this, for example, is a 10 milliliter pipette. And you should, this does not have the thing in it. <laughs> a lot of places have, you know, little trigger things. Looks like a little gun. You stick it on there, and then you drop the liquid. We're fucking old school. We have these little plunger things. These also work just as well. You just stick it on there, and then you just draw up liquid the old-fashioned way. Never, under any circumstances, should you blow into the pipette. I know certain people who do, and those people are just called fucking old. A lot of old scientists still do this because it's just their thing. It's just a thing that we don't do anymore because it's gross and unsanitary and we know better. A simple thing you can do if there's some liquid stuck in there is that you remove the plunger or the whatever and you just push it again with more air. It's simple. You don't need to put your mouth on it. I know how much you like to suck dick. Please keep that outside of the lab. These serological pipette tips, they're good for everyday usage, but they're not insanely accurate. If you really want to be insanely accurate, you wanna use what's called a class A volumetric pipette. They have the amount written on this oval shape right in the center. And they have this little line here that tells you that's the exact point where you should stop drawing up liquid. Now, these go hand in hand. These are class A volumetric flasks. Same principle, it's just really accurate. You can read on here, it says TC, 20 degrees Celsius, that means that ideally under 20 degrees Celsius, this is gonna be 500 milliliters. And you can also even see plus or minus 0.15 milliliters, which is you know just the tiniest variation that it can possibly be. Now, why would you wanna use these? 
Well, for one example, if you need to make a series of standard solutions for some kind of experiment, a standard is a standard for a reason. You need to be as accurate as fucking possible. You can't just be haphazard about it like, oh, it's plus or minus some big variation. No. Now here's a machine that I both hate and love. It's an analytical balance. I love it because you can weight things to many significant digits, which is really cool. It's accurate. That can also be the annoying thing about it. It's really sensitive. You can be weighing something and it can read 18 point blah 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 grams and the last digit is always gonna be a fucking asshole not gonna know whether it wants to go one digit up or one digit down and it'll keep fluctuating and you're just gonna be sitting there watching it like please waste my fucking time some more. To minimize that you always want to make sure that all the little doors are closed on the analytical balance that the analytical balance is centered and that you're not pressing on the platform a lot because that can fluctuate the readings so treat it gently this is uh i mean we here we like to call it a top loader balance it's nowhere near as accurate as the analytical balance but if you're weighing a lot of big stuff you know gross amounts you would use something like this here are a bunch of graduated cylinders not much really to talk about them they're self-explanatory they're just like whores, you know, they're always available, always here for you, you can use them whenever. This machine is called an HPLC. What this is, is basically you analyze really tiny amounts of liquid, just insane numbers, insane analysis, on. you can get so much information. Downside is that this takes a while, you hook it up to a computer, do all the computer stuff. I don't really have anything to do with this, so whatever. But just so you know, this is what a typical HPLC looks like. If you see these weird doodads around, these are called desiccators. Long story short, if you want to keep something dry, you put it in here. Here we have a vortexer. This one's a vortex genie, so if you need to vortex something, you just do that. Do some mixing. Someone put this here, I don't know if I put it here, but it's pretty fun to play with. This is a thermocycler, and it's a thermocycler. <laughs> I just, I just, it, 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 you, put, you put DNA samples in here to heat them up and cool them down, and that, I'll go into that in a whole nother video, so don't worry about that. But that's what a thermocycler looks like. See something cool? This is a genetic sequencer. I felt fucking sexy saying that. This, um... You, you just, you, you put things in here, like DNA, yeah, you put DNA in here, and like it, it does things, like, um, it, that goes, no, it, it, yeah, I guess, it, it does, it, it basically shows you the DNA sequence, it prints it out, and it, you know, plug it in, it's like, it's there, it's done, it's science. So here is what you call a fume hood. It's a pretty self-explanatory thing. If you're working with chemicals that have a lot of fumes, you work in here with it. And you turn it on, and you can hear it going, and it'll just suck up all the air out. And then it has other useful things, like you can have these little nozzles with air, or vacuums, or nitrogen, whatever. Important thing to note though, a fume hood is not just for chemicals that have lots of fumes and will make you cough. If you're working with more volatile experiments, you'd want to do it in here so that you can have this protective screen in case something goes fucking boom in your face. Now, this hood is much different. It's not a fume hood. You've definitely seen it already behind me. This is more of a biological hood. This is where you would work with biological materials like petri dishes and stuff like that you don't always have to work with them here but if you're you know working with something really really sensitive like let's say you're working with brain cells and petri dishes or something like that you know you want to work with that in here this is not 
in commission anymore, so I don't need to worry about it, nor do I ever use it. So here's a pretty standard micro centrifuge. You spin down samples that fit in tubes like these, micro centrifuge tubes. And when you spin anything in any centrifuge, you always want to make sure that the samples are right across from each other and that they weigh just about the same because if one weighs differently then it's going to throw off the whole thing and it's going to fuck everything up. Now this model actually doesn't do anything if it detects an imbalance, which is really nice. However, the bigger models like this motherfucker, this doesn't have that feature so you need to weigh things. So for example, you want to have five test tubes here, you got to put five test tubes here and you have to make sure that they weigh just about the same. Just fill up the other five tubes with something simple like water. And an easy way to make sure that they're both balanced is to use a scale like this. So it's really fucking important that you make sure your samples are balanced correctly. Because if they're not, and this thing is going at a really high speed, the fucking lid is gonna explode and everything's gonna be flying out and everyone's gonna be fucking mad at you. Eject to see you're joking. I never joke about my work, 007. And that's exactly what someone who used to work here did a long time ago. And that's why they're not working here anymore. Over here we have a standard pH meter with an electrode. I'll go over the pH and pH meters in its own video. I'll go over all these things you see here on their own videos. This is a power supply for a gel electrophoresis and this is a conductance meter which also has an electrode. So this is power film. Power film is your friend. You'll be using it a lot to cover things because all your fucking co-workers are motherfuckers who misplace all the caps to every bottle and fuck! I don't actually know the general name for these. We always call them Kim Wipes because it's a popular brand. These are very fine tissues and you use these a lot to wipe down instruments. So like a microscope, a computer screen, or the electrodes like the pH electrodes, conductivity electrodes. This is an incubator. If you want to keep, for example, some bacteria growing still, you put it in here in the petri dishes. Here's a water bath. Put test tubes or whatever in there if you need if it needs to be in a water bath. Here is a speed vac. This isn't just a centrifuge. This is a centrifuge that is also a vacuum. Now, why would you need to do that? Well, sometimes you need to concentrate some samples in these little tubes and it'll, you know, throw out some moisture and then concentrate the solution. A vacuum oven and here's a vacuum pump that makes the vacuum or the vacuum oven. Important to note all kinds of alcohol, all kinds of flammable material should go in its own flammable cabinet. Keep it all together in one place so that if one thing blows up they all blow up. Here is a UV light box Basically, it's a source for UV lights, and you can see DNA, for example, in there on a gel. Now, really important safety tip. Whenever you're working with UV light, always fucking put on UV goggles. Because if you stare at shit with your own naked eyes, you're going to burn your fucking eyes off. We have a blender. It's Blenders are useful when we want to mix things up. This spectrophotometer is really fucking old, it's from the 80s, but it's still useful. As long as the spectrophotometer is working, it works, and it has a lot of significant digits, and it's accurate. This is another kind of spectrophotometer called a nanodrop. This is much different than the bigger one that I showed you back there, because this one, you can analyze tiny, tiny amounts of liquid in here, and you hook it up to the computer, and you use the computer to analyze it, and I also fucking hate this machine. I don't want to get into it. It's uh, traumatic. It's so, so traumatic. I hate this machine so much. Makes me, makes me uh, want to rethink my life choices. This son of a bitch has put me through so much. So much pain. So much sorrow. 
anyway and of course we have refrigerators and freezers now just like the microwave please don't store any food or drink in here this is not to put your fucking hot pockets anything like that Now, before I actually show you how to clean lab glassware, I need to talk about distilled water. Distilled water comes from a tap that normally looks like this. You turn it to the side, and then the water comes out. A lot of labs like to add little extra doodads, little extra filters, whatever. DI water tap is very special. It's highly pressurized. It goes through this whole system. It's sterilized with UV radiation and all these fucking things, uh, whatever. Now the thing about distilled water is that it's pure H2O. There's nothing else in it. There's no minerals, there's no other ions, it's just pure water. Pure sterilized water. Now you need to clean lab glassware with distilled water. Why? So that when you do an experiment, you know that your mixtures, your compounds, whatever, are not going to be affected by any variations from normal tap water, like other minerals or chemicals that might be found in tap water. So you need to clean all lab glassware with distilled water. Oh, and before I forget, funny enough, if you turn this on, always make sure it's off. Because if you leave this tap on, I mentioned that this whole thing's pressurized. If you leave this on, the water's eventually going to burst out and it's going to flood everything and everyone's going to be mad at you because that's what I did once. So let me show you how I normally clean lab glassware. I always have this tub full of warm water and detergent. I let some bottles soak for a while. It kind of depends if they have some crud on it that really is hard to get off. So I let them soak so that it loosens. Then I take some bottles, I rinse it with tap water, rinse it five times, then I move on to the DI water tap. Now, the thing about the DI water tap is that this shit is very, very expensive. You don't just want to turn it on and be like <laughs> cleaning everything like waterfall. No, you don't want to do that. So what you do instead is that, now I only have one hand free, so this is going to be kind of difficult. What you do instead is that you put in like just about a quarter of distilled water and then you shake it up like this. And then you do that two more times. And then after that, when you're done, you leave it out to dry. So now I'm gonna go over some simple aseptic techniques. Aseptic techniques are these little tips and tricks to minimize contamination when you're working mostly with microbiology. This mostly applies to microbiology, but it could apply to other scenarios that I haven't thought of right now because I'm fucking hungry and I want to finish this video. So the goal with this is to aim to be sterile, as sterile as possible. Quick jump over to the lab glassware stuff. When you clean lab glassware with distilled water, that's not sterile. That's just making sure that there's no other chemicals in the glassware. In order to sterilize something, you need to put it in the autoclave. When working with bacteria, everything involved in it has to be sterilized. All the pipette tips, all the petri dishes, all the glassware needs to be sterilized. So for example, let's pick some random auger here. You're gonna grow a bacteria that grows in this auger, like it uses this auger for food. Auger is basically nutrients for bacteria. But there's many different types of auger because many different types of bacteria like to grow on many different things. So you put the auger into a glass container, you stir it up with water, and then you autoclave that. And then after it's autoclaved, you pour that mixture into petri dishes and then let it solidify. And then you have a petri dish where you can grow your bacteria. These things have been sterilized in the autoclave and you can tell because it has this tape with the black lines on it. Now before you put anything in the autoclave, whether it be physical material like these tubes or liquids in the bottles, you want to put autoclave tape on it. Now the autoclave tape normally looks blank. 
but after it's been autoclave, these black lines appear, which, which are there to indicate that it's been autoclave. Now, with autoclave material, you don't want to just scatter it around with the rest of the stuff in the lab. You want to have sterilized material in its own place, away from everything else, because you're still treating it like it's sterilized. And general rule of thumb, for example, once you open it, it's done. It's not sterilized anymore. You take it off from wherever you put it and you start using it on your lab bench. One very important thing, if you want to autoclave something, always make sure it's Pyrex. Pyrex can withstand very high temperatures. If you're not sure if something can withstand the autoclave, don't use it. It'll melt, blow up, God knows what's gonna happen. In general, always make sure that what you're gonna put in the autoclave can actually withstand the autoclave because it's gonna be really fucking hot. It's like 140 degrees Celsius around there. Before you do anything, you wanna spray down your work area with isopropyl alcohol. I like to use 70% of isopropyl alcohol, it's good enough. And you wipe it down, you wipe everything down, and then you can move your sterilized material onto here and start working with it. Now, even when you have bags, what I like to do is I like to even spray the bags also before I open them. Just spray everything. If you're not sure if something was cleaned, spray it, rub it, make sure. Now, a normal lab would have what's called a Bunsen burner. Now, we've all seen Bunsen burners. We don't have that in this lab. What we got is this. We just got propane tanks. Now, when you're working with microbes, pretend like this is a tube full of E. coli and you want to pipette some E. coli out of here. You want to have this flame on and you just want to pass it briefly. Don't fucking put it in front of it because you're going to like burn the whole thing off. You just want to like pass it right over it and then you work with it and then before you close it, you pass it again. Oh, and don't forget, you also want to spray your hands. Just spray your hands. If you think you touch a lot of stuff in between the experiment that contaminates your hands, just keep spraying it. And that's it for this episode of Angry Scientists Lab Basics. Next episode, I'm going to talk about gel electrophoresis. If you don't know what the fuck that is, well, hold on to your dicks until then. Thank you.